So welcome back, everybody, for season three. So we thought we would change things up a little bit for the podcast. One of the goals that Jesse and I are trying to do is bridge the gap between fresh floors and paper floors. Because one of the things that we've noticed is we have very similar problems. I think one of the foremost problems that everyone faces when they're starting out with a business is pricing. How do you figure out pricing? And so we brought these two amazing ladies, Karen and Jesslyn, in to talk about their story on how they got started and how did they figure out pricing for their business. Welcome to season two of the Paper Talk podcast, where we have candid conversations with artists and industry leaders from around the world. Our goal is to share knowledge, connect our community, and elevate the artistry of our craft. Hi, I'm Jesse Chu. Hello, I am Quinn Wynn, and we are the founders of the Paper Florist Collective. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Paper Talk. We are going to dive right in today, and our topic today is a really important one. It's pricing. It's a really hot topic, and it really doesn't matter if you've just started selling or you've been in the business for years and years. You're going to wonder if you're pricing your goods and services properly, and I think that's a really tricky thing, pricing. There's really no proper way of doing it. And there's so many facets to consider. So today we've invited two of our favorite people to chat with us about this really important topic. Uh, Jesslyn Pettigrew of Mossy Skate Flower Farm and Erin Shackleford of Canvas Design. Jesslyn is a flower farmer in Mount Vernon, Washington, and Erin is a florist designer out of Friday Harbor, Washington. So welcome, ladies. We're so excited to have you guys on to chat with us about how you price and the, and the decisions and thoughts that go into your pricing. So let's start this discussion by having everybody kind of introduce your business. Tell us about what kind of services and products you offer and how you approached pricing depending on, you know, your solution, the the thoughts that went through your head when you were doing that, or, you know, things that you've learned, all those things that went into, you know, setting your pricing for your products and services. Hi, everybody. I'm excited to be here. Thanks for including me in Paper Talk. So tell us about your story. You do not have a background in being a florist. It was definitely a career change for you. It was definitely a career change. Flowers has always been kind of where I fed my soul, but definitely wasn't my career. Never even really gave myself license to think that I would have a career in flowers. I always took the financially responsible path and got a job right out of college and did that whole thing. And so I was in the corporate world for years. And then I won't go into all the all the life changes, but just decided to make a financially irresponsible move and follow my heart and opened up Camus Designs, which is a studio-based floral business in San Juan Island, Washington, which is north of Seattle. And when we first started in Camus, I didn't know what I was doing with pricing. I had owned a business before, but it was not floral. So I had some business expertise, but I did not have pricing expertise by any means. So it was a lot of just trying to figure things out. I was so excited that first season that I was booking weddings that any profit to me seemed like I was being successful. And it wasn't till after that first season when the summer ended, because most of our weddings are destination weddings. So it wasn't until the summer ended that I put my kind of dorky business hat on and looked back at what I had done that summer, thinking that I had done great for that first year, which maybe I had. I I mean, I booked several weddings, which was great. But when I looked at my profit margin, I realized that it was not a sustainable business model. It's a hard reality for a business person to face. Mm-hmm. Yep. It's like you're thinking you're doing so well and you're pricing because people are taking the time to like talk to you book you and make it happen. And then you look at your numbers and you're like, I barely covered my supplies. Yep. Yeah. I didn't even pay myself. So it's really sad. Yeah, I definitely didn't pay myself. Can I, sorry, sure. Aaron, can um, I ask you, I mean, yeah. you're going to go and get into the pricing, your thoughts on pricing, but when you did that shift, what were your expectations in terms of your first year? Were your expectations for your first year that, oh, I'm just going to either not make a profit or just cover my expenses or to make a profit? Like, were there expectations going in when you were deciding how you're pricing? Yeah, great question. And I think because I had started another business, again, not floral related before, I had more realistic expectations than I would have if I had not. So I did not have the expectation that I would be bringing a ton of money in that first year. I was hoping that I wouldn't lose money. I would have been satisfied if I broke even. I just knew that starting with a a business and I did 
have some out-of-pocket expenses that were more significant than I had thought that they were going to be, I knew that I wouldn't be breaking it in that first year. So I planned accordingly. I mean, I, and I'm still very fiscally conservative because I'm always scared as a small business owner that the money won't come in. And so how I pay myself and when I pay myself, I look at, I think maybe very differently because I do just, it's just me. I've got money issues. So I I try to not pay myself until I know I really have that money, if that makes sense. And it didn't make full sense to me until COVID hit. So it actually worked to my advantage this year because I tend to not pay myself until the wedding happens. So we can get into that more later. But yeah, that that first year, Jesse, I, I definitely set expectations that I would be proud to book some weddings. And it was more about getting the name out there. I didn't have the expectation that I would make much money, if any. That is an excellent plan, Erin. I think a lot of people, when they start a business, they don't set expectations. Do they want to make a profit? What is their goal for the first year? In reality, a lot of small business, you're, you're not expecting a really good return out of the three or four years when you start out. It's really hard to buckle down and dig into your savings the first two years because that's really what you're doing. You're building your name. You're building your reputation. So good for you for planning that out. Jesslyn, would you mind telling us about your story and your background? Of course, of course. So I am on my sixth season of flower farming, and I just kind of stumbled across it after being in customer service industries from coffee barista, bartender, hotel manager, event planner, you name it, I've done it. I'd done that for a long time, trying to make sure that I did the right thing, paying the bills, paying for college. And then after a divorce and having two babies, I was just like, I don't know what I want to do anymore. And I want to support my kids and I want to be home for them during their schedules and their their life moment. So when I came across flower farming, it was kind of like a, huh, I never thought of that. I think I like flowers. I think I like plants. I always have enjoyed them. <laughs> and I just started falling head over heels and diving into it. But at the beginning, there wasn't a whole lot of information about it. I mean, if I had started farming now, you can get everything you want in just a Facebook group. Five, six years ago, it was still new. And there were some articles and there were some specialist sharing and there were some workshops. But now it's exploded. But pricing has been something that you have to still kind of research for yourself. I started off with finding out what the local florist would purchase. I sell wholesale primarily. So my goal at the time was I will sell my flowers to the local shop. I'll just drive them there and sell out of my trunk. And it was going pretty well, but they weren't good. And I couldn't compete with what they were importing. And so I ended up having to reestablish what it was I was going to do and how am I going to drive around and make money on it because I'm not making money. I'm wasting so much time. So over time, I've had to decide where it was that I want my business and then ask my competitors point blank. And then also try it out with the customers. Sometimes it's been, okay, I think I need to make XYZ back. (laughs) I will charge XYZ too. And let's see if that works. Oh, shoot. It doesn't work to cover my bills. Sorry. I'm going to have to be stronger about sticking to what I need to make my business work. It's just one of those trial and errors. And I think over the last six years, not only do you lose money in the first three, I'm I'm just starting to now see a bit of a profit. I'm not really claiming that I pay myself yet, but I... I'm noticing that not only does your business need to build confidence because you're getting better at it, you're getting more confident with your product and your customer base, but also that you need to just believe in the fact that in order to have a business, you have to have expenses and income and they have to offset each other. And you should know that your your goal is profit, not just for you to go, oh, well, at least I paid that thing off. <laughs> you should be making yes. that and then <laughs> That's the goal. How about you, Jesse? Well, how did you get started and how did you figure out your pricing? So I make paper flowers, as you know, and I started my business when officially when somebody approached an old friend. I came across an old friend who approached me to make a bouquet. And at the time I didn't have any experience, so to speak. I had made paper flowers, posted them on social media. So you could say I had some something to offer. But when I was trying to figure out what to quote her, there were two things that were problematic for me. One, having no idea what people charge in our industry. 
And at the time, four years ago, there were too many of us offering uh, uh, like full bouquets. And so I had no idea. And then secondly, she was a friend. And when you're starting out on your business, you always feel like, oh, friends and families. Not that they get a special discount, but you feel somewhat thankful that you're getting, you know, you're getting business and they happen to be family and friends. So maybe, yeah, automatically you feel like, oh, I can't charge them that much. I need to. And so those things were going on in my head. So my first bouquet, I definitely didn't charge enough, but that's okay. It was also my first. So like the other two ladies, it was not only was I thankful for having a sale, but also I felt at the time as an artist, I wasn't, I wasn't able to charge a certain price. And it wasn't at a certain price point because I didn't have the experience. I didn't have, you know, a reputation. I didn't have a brand. I didn't have, I wasn't established. So, but what I did was I decided thinking to myself, what would I be happy with at this moment? And I was very lucky because at the time of my first sale, I was in on mat leaf. I had just, I think Tristan, my youngest was three months. So it wasn't like I was working anyways. So I was very lucky and fortunate to have that kind of flexibility where you know, paying the bills wasn't, it wasn't my job at the time, it was my husband's. (laughs) So I had that kind of flexibility of thinking, okay, well, what am I satisfied with right now? What's fair to me right now? And what would my customer be okay with paying without feeling like one, they're being gypped by someone who's inexperienced. And two, that I'm not charging too cheaply because that would look really poorly on my flowers, on my art. So that happened. And over the first year, I had a couple of, I was very lucky. I had a couple of orders for bouquets and every one of them, I started upping my price. And the thing is, I had no idea what I was charging the other clients. It was just all in my mind, all in my mind that, okay, my next bouquet, I'm going to charge 50, $75, hundred dollars more, because I feel like I've reached a certain point that I can charge that. And so every single bouquet that year, I think I have four or five, I upped my price. And now I, you know, now since then it's been like quadrupled, you know, five folds, but it's different. Like when you were saying, like, it's like my expectations, this, like at the beginning are completely different from my expectations today. And so I think your pricing, the things you consider all that, it's really an evolution of your your business itself as well, because I'm not just offering bouquets now, I'm offering other things. So how does that all tie in? And when I determine what I'm going to price this particular product. So yeah, like it's been an evolution. That's what I can say. But I mean, like throwing it out there, I, for my bouquets, I charge a flat fee. And I've been very clear about that, even in paper to profits and all my other, you know, and all our other discussions, I charge a flat fee. And that's something that I'm comfortable with. It doesn't necessarily compensate me for all my time and talent, but it's built my brand. And, you know, we can, like Aaron said, we can talk more about that, but my flat fee, there's a reason for that. It's because there's some things you can't quantify. You can't place a value on or price on, but I'm still okay with that price because it gives me the creative freedom to do whatever I want without being tied in to specific flowers that you want that are at specific costs that you probably wouldn't pay me otherwise because it's too expensive but I want to use it because I want to make sure your bouquet is what is what I can deliver for you is what's in my head and what you're happy with. So a little bit different from fresh, you know, fresh florists and farmers, you don't really have as much, uh, what do you call it? Flexibility in that. But as an artist, it's a little bit different. There's waters are a little bit more murky in terms of, you know, what choices we can make on behalf of our customers that we're willing to, and we're willing to, you know, take that on because it's not as growing something, literally my time. But yeah, that's how I started. And that's how I, some thoughts that into my pricing. But Quinn, but you, because your offerings are completely different from mine. And they're also different from Aaron and Jesslyn. So tell us a little bit about how you made those decisions in terms of pricing. Well, there's so many different components to my business. Not only do I create paper flowers, I teach paper flowers. I do a subscription box to send out materials and tutorials out. I do commercial work. I do in-store displays. There's so many different variables. And I hate to say pricing is so difficult. And it really, when I first started out, I'm lucky to be living in Seattle area where there's a lot of tech companies. Our pricings are definitely a lot higher than the rest of the country because we have a lot of people that live in our area that can afford a higher price point. But saying that, we do have a lot of really talented people in this area. I would say in the West Coast, we probably have over a dozen really talented paper floors that are competing for all these tech companies. So 
saying all that, there is a lot of resources where people can pull and you're fighting for that chance to be a fit for that particular branding. How do I go about deciding pricing? That is such, it's such an interesting question. It's such a hot topic, no matter how long you've been in business, how you're pivoting, how you are changing what you are to where you want to be. You have to think about price in the future. You always have to set your expectation. What do I want to accomplish this year? If I want to get my name out, you definitely want to be partnering and collaborating with people that will push your brand up a little bit higher. For example, when I worked with Nordstrom, the pricing for that was very interesting because when I was first starting out, that was, I think, only my second year in business. I was so lucky to have met the director for the social media platform. There was pretty much a barter. I didn't get any compensation from it. But doing that was a give and take. I was able to push my name. I got on the Nordstrom blog. I got featured on their Instagram, which had like thousands and thousands of followers I couldn't have done when I first started out. So with so many different types of product offerings and services, how did you go about deciding, let's say, mainly your, because I know for your bouquets and weddings, you do a lot of those and you do practically full service, mm-hmm. <laughs> you, you know, <laughs> practically full service, not only at the beginning, but afterwards you rearrange everything and the you know vases and stuff like that too. You go to their houses, you meet them, you talk to them. Mm-hmm. How did, yep. how do you go about thinking about pricing when you do so much for one client? I write everything out. I think that's the really key part where if you have something stated, and it's visual and you see it and you're talking to the customer, you already developed that relationship and you're like, oh, I can, you know, I can get this customer. I just lower my price because you're like, I really want this. But you look at your board and you say, you know what? This is my price. I'm going to stick with it. And that way, when you're talking to them, and you see it, you can't change your mind because, you know, you already stated it out there. You made a promise to yourself that I'm going to be charging this month. It's so easy slip down and pull your price down just to get that particular client. I think we all dealt with that. I think being strong and being firm will only be better for you. It'll be hard. I would say it's definitely a struggle with me when I am out meeting a client and I don't see that board and I'm like, don't change your mind, but it's so easy because you already create this relationship with them. I think that's one thing that I've tried really hard is being very firm in my mind that this is my price. This is how I'm setting it. And I think another part was like, how do you know when to raise your price? I think everyone struggles with that. Like I've been at this price, I'm getting a lot of good business. Do I stay at it to bring in that regular income or do I raise my price? And then the order stopped because people were like, whoa, that's so pricey. Mm -hmm. I think it's a decision you have to make yourself. It's a tough one. I mean, just think when you were talking about you know, sticking to your to your guns, I don't know about you, but I still do this and I try not to, but at the very beginning, like I would hum and haw about a price. Somebody would email me and be like, hey, what do you, you know, what do you quote for this, this and this? And I'll type something out and then I'll think about it and I'll change it. And then I'll be like, oh, I don't know. And I would never hit that send button because I would go over that price in my head over and over and over again. And then I'll send it and then hear nothing back. So now I'm just like, what is the point? (laughs) Ghosting, yes. I'd be like, what is the point? Because it's all in your mind. (laughs) Either they're going to accept your price or they're not. So, you know, just kind of be firm. Like you said, be firm about it. That gives just whatever price it is. Maybe you have a price list. We talked about this before. Maybe you have a price list, which really helps because you're writing down all your pricing. You can compare all your prices for different flowers, for different services. Just stick to your guns, throw it out there. And you know what? If they're the right customer, then they will say yes. If they are the customer that wants to bargain all the time, it doesn't matter what price you give them. They're going to try to bargain anyways, or they're just, you know, it's any price is going to be too high for them. So like, I don't know you guys, but I think half the time we're fighting with ourselves. Mm-hmm. Like we're like having this kind of dialogue with ourselves that the customer has no idea about how much like it's like, we're like, oh my gosh, what if it were too expensive? What if we're not? But I think that's why this conversation is so important. It's really about like, how do we price in a way that one, like we feel we'll pay, we'll pay our expenses, we'll make a little bit of profit, but it's also fair and reasonable to us because as an artist, I think part of that quote that we give has nothing to do with our expenses or our profit, it has everything to do with our reputation, mm-hmm. our goodwill, our brand. And I mean, we can talk about also, you know, what market do you want to hit? Do you want to hit that luxury? Tree market. Well, most of that, 50% of that, is has nothing to do with our expenses, right? 
So like those are such interesting like facets that I guess you kind of have to consider either at the beginning of your business or as you grow as a business and your reputation grows mm-hmm. in Nordstrom and, you know, having all of those, and I wouldn't even say a reputation so much as where your brand or where your business sits in terms of the market, those things to consider when you're evolving your pricing. Erin, you had a comment. I'll let you jump in. Yeah, there's just so much that Jesse's saying that, that resonates with me and, and I'll just touch on a couple things. But first of all, I think women tend to be a little bit more wanting to please. And so you have a majority, not all obviously, but you have the majority of the people in this industry, whether it's fresh flowers or paper flowers. I'm going to take Jessalyn out of this because I think I'm loving to see the the increase in women farmers, but I think historically it's been a a male dominated field, but for fresh and paper flowers, I would assume that it's the majority of women field. So I think we tend to be more people pleaser. We, we start meeting with that client. We want them to have the perfect day. So a lot of times it's easy to come off of our price because we want them to have the perfect day. They haven't asked us to come off of our price or maybe they have, but a lot of times it's our role to be able to strike that balance. We get a lot of brides that they want um, their dream wedding. They want peonies. They want ranunculas. They want garden roses and their budget doesn't match at all. So it's a balancing game. And, and Jesse, I think you hit on a lot of great points because it's, it's how do you want to run your business? Um, to me, the relationship between me and those couples is imperative. I want to make a career at this. I want this to be my business. I want this to be my, my, um, how I'm making a living, but it's very important to me about who I'm working with. So it's a really hard balance sometime to look at your pricing model and have it align with your business ethics and serving your client. It's, it's a constant balancing act. I think those were definitely. Well, and I was just thinking, so while we're talking about who your client is in my business model, I have multiple clients kind of like you, Quinn, where you have kind of like three different businesses going on at the same time. I have my roadside stand customers. I have my wholesale designer customers and I have now retail customers and when I look at each customer, they might be getting the same stem, but the stem goes for a different price depending on what's going on. Now, if you compare stem to stem, you're thinking, what the heck? Why do they get special treatment? But it goes into the volumes game and the pre-order game and the freshness game. But being that I've had to decide, like have this mini argument conversation with myself with each one of these facets and stand by what I need to. I also struggle with the fact that in my region, flower stems go for a certain rate. But when I go to another region to sell, I can get more. And so how do I decide sell in those different regions? And do I make it easy on myself where I have one price point? And so that means I'm high against my competitors in my local region, but I might be a little lower than the ones in the other region I go to. But each one of these things are conversations I've had to have with myself. And it's built up confidence over the last few years to the point where this year, six years later, and after having a number of jobs and hats, and I did own a retail business. So like you, Erin, I have this background of kind of understanding what I need to do for business. This, I feel like flowers and the artistry ends up being a lot more emotionally involved. There's a lot more of I'm giving away a part of myself and I, you're going to like me or hate me personally. And so it's been a lot more of a struggle to come to the decisions on these. But it's in these six years, I'm finally going, okay. This is what I charge this type of customer. This is what I need to charge for that type of customer, whether I'm there or not, I'm getting there. And certain things are going to have a um, all-inclusive price because then I, like you, Jesse, get to have more artist leeway. I love having my do-it-yourself bucket for the people who are budget bride because I say it's 70 to 100 stems. I might put 150 because I loved that person and I loved the colors and I have (laughs) a plant that has a lot of bloom. Or it's at the end of the season and I want to make sure I'm giving you what I promised you, but I'm really squeezing by and it's a challenge. I think it's important to dive into the fact that we are women and we are emotional and we are trying to bridge the gap we'll have. But at the same time, we have to make ourselves happy too, which is really hard because we ha- we keep changing what makes us happy. And yeah. so <laughs> at the end of so the true. minute, you gotta go, wait a minute. 
I am a business owner. And I have these conversations with colleagues. Like sometimes even now I'll call them and be like, is it okay that I just charged a hundred dollars for this bucket of flowers? Do you think you like it? What do you think? <laughs> and, you know, we have these combos every once in a while to boost our morale. Yes. And it ends up being like, that's right. I am a business owner, so I can stick to this. And the customer is not the expert. They're just waiting for you to give them an answer. You know? Yeah, no, it's so true. We were talking before this, um, just being warming up our speakers. And Jessalyn brought up a very good example about how other industry, you see prices. You go to a grocery store, you see your competitor prices right off the bat. You see when they have sales. It's a different game for us. When we're talking about paper flowers and fresh flowers, a lot of people do not disclose prices. And I think that's the hard thing is like, no one knows what the real price is. And it differentiates from different parts of the country, different parts of the city. If you're in farm country, if you're in suburbia, if you're in the city, prices will be different. How do you know where you fit in? I think that's the really hard part because sometimes you're not selling to your local company, yeah. I mean, local people, but you're selling it to another person, another city, another country. How do you configure that out? This is a really interesting discussion. And I feel like we can go on and on and on. And you guys, we decided we are going to start a new episode. It's going to be called Paper X Talk. This is going to be a lecture series about pricing. And I feel like every one of us have gone through pricing war within ourselves, with the other competitors. We want to start a discussion, a lecture series on pricing, and we would like to invite you to come join us for a paper X talk that's going to be happening on October 17th. We'll be sending out more information for you, but we want you to go to the paperforest.org backslash paper talk. You're going to see a post about this particular episode. We want you to go in, comment what problems you are having with pricing. What are you personally going through? What do you want us to talk about and help you resolve this problem that you're having? So I want you guys to come and join us. It'll be Jesse, myself, Aaron, and Jesslyn. We're going to be talking more about pricing. If you are struggling with pricing, I, we invite you to come and join us. It's going to be a very amazing discussion on pricing. And I think it's going to help you resolve some of the inner struggles that you're facing right now. And because we're all from various different backgrounds, I think we're going to cover a lot of different problems and situations that you might be in. So come and join us October 17th with Paper X. Thank you so much, Erin and Jesslyn, for hopping on to Paper Talk today. It was amazing to talk about the pricing, how you came about on your story, on how you started your business and how you figured out pricing, because it's such an important part for every business person or entrepreneur that's starting out to understand there are so many different components on pricing. So thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much guys. for having us. Yeah, thanks, Quinn. This has been fantastic and such a great and relevant topic. Absolutely.